Senate should be done with uh, Senate bills and committee, and House is done with House bills and committee. Of course, almost everything we do has money attached to it, so they all come to the Appropriations Committee. And the job of the Appropriations Committee is to look at the, you got a fiscal note. We have a, a whole office called the, the Joint Fiscal Office, and they're, they're numbers crunchers, they're accountants, and uh, because we have a citizen legislature, I, I've never claimed to be particularly savvy about about money. I used to joke that it, for years I was not on any of the money committees because they didn't trust me with money. But, but I'm on appropriations now. And what it is is that we do rely heavily on the expertise of people who really are just numbers crunchers and accountants. And they kind of work, hold our hands through all this stuff. And it, it, it used to be, or at least theoretically, it would be that the appropriations committee would look at each appropriation and decide whether or not it was uh, to be justified. And perhaps add money if they thought it wasn't enough, reduce the appropriation. What we've been dealing with for the last several years, though, is that um, the people of Vermont have been pretty clear that they really, really don't want to pay any more taxes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the governor, I think, was elected largely on a no tax, no fee, or no new taxes, no new fees mm -hmm. platform. And uh, you've got your, uh, I know that a lot of people would look at the, the Democrats and the progressives as tax to spend left, and, you know, just, just too eager to spend money. But as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a and I think every one of my colleagues, and I count myself, is, is aware that we're in the business of spending other people's money. <laughs> and uh, that that has a moral responsibility to it. Also, politically, it's you get into trouble when you spend too much money. If you spend money that you don't have, of course, which a lot of states do. I mean, a lot of states go deeply into debt. We've gotten ourselves into some trouble by not fully funding uh, pensions over many years. Uh, uh, it's it's a bad policy, and probably anything that costs money that we actually raise taxes for would be uh, politically difficult, as well uh, as. Well as sort of an, uh, an affront to the people who, as I say, have been pretty clear they don't want to pay anymore. What that means is that we have to work with what we've got, and any money you spend on one thing is money you're not going to spend on something else. And so the entire budget is a balancing act. And uh, the budget originates, we talked about this other times, originates in the House constitutionally. But it is. It comes to the Senate. The House is finishing up its budget this week, and then we will get it. But we've been. We haven't been sitting twiddling our thumbs waiting. We've been examining the, the budgets of every uh, agency uh, in anticipation. Uh, what we have done last week was to take various bills that have come to us because there's an appropriation, and we have taken the appropriation out of the bill and then advance the bill to the full Senate with no appropriation. And the understanding is that we will do the balancing act when we have all the elements. In other words, we need the budget in front of us. And then we will decide, OK, what do we have? And everyone, and it's interesting, on the committee, everyone has their own particular thing they're, they're advocating for. I am pushing in particular to make sure that we do adequate funding for parent-child centers because I think they do important work. We hear a lot, we talk a lot about children having children and parents who don't know how to be parents. And there are folks, I hear from them all the time, who will say basically, it's not society's fault that they're in trouble. It's not my fault that they're in trouble. No one told them to have unprotected sex. No one told them to drop out of high school. It's their fault. It's not my fault. Surprisingly, I actually agree with that. I, where I disagree with people who, who say that we think that way is, I don't end the discussion there. My view is, it's infuriating. You're right. Now that that's settled, what are we going to do about it? And, and one of the things that the, that the parent child centers do is they sort of take dysfunctional families under their wing and show them how to do this. 
and uh, certainly the family place down in, in um, I think it's actually Norwich. It's right on the line between Norwich and Hartford. Uh, they they do things like they they have they tell people you know when you go for the job interview you know you, you have the right to have tattoos up and down your arm but maybe you want to wear a long sleeve shirt <laughs> and and when if you get the job you know you got to show up yeah. <laughs> and and if you got to call in sick. Uh, you don't call in sick 20 minutes into the shift. You know, just basic things that people take for granted that a lot of people don't know. They, they, and you can't believe they don't know it, but they don't. And, and it's just that, that general, you know, guidance, and, 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 and it's, it's not a matter of, of, of handouts, the old uh, hand up rather than a handout. And, and just sort of just you know nurturing, and and it yields results. It actually does really yield results. So I'm I'm pushing with that. And the other one is, uh, I I think, for all the issues we deal with, the overarching issue right now for the world is global warming. And and while I would like to see a, a sweeping uh, reform to to really really get into it. We have recognized that politically, uh, efforts on global warming are, are met with a lukewarm response from the public and from our colleagues. And uh, certainly the possibility of carbon pricing in the last election, that was pretty much one of the big issues, was, are you for a carbon tax? Yeah. And uh, so there has been a sort of a retreat on the part of global warming activists and decided to focus on a couple of achievable short-term goals, one of which is weatherization, which is which is cutting-edge modern twenty you know uh, twenty nineteen environmentalism, but it's also an old Vermont tradition. You don't waste. You shouldn't waste. My brother Kurt has become a, uh, the chair of the transportation committee in the house. I was interviewed by Digger about him and his environmentalism. I said, well, our environmentalism comes from our Vermont born and raised grandfather. You know, you never know when you might need that. Don't throw that out. And I just, my grandfather was, was conservative with a lowercase c. He took care of stuff. And he didn't waste stuff. And he pounded that into his grandsons, that you don't waste. Right. And, you, and, and so that notion of, of weatherization, seal up the house so you're not putting heat out into the cold, which is just totally wasteful. Doesn't make sense. Uh, we have a weatherization program. It's for poor people. And uh, one thing is to make sure that we have adequate funding for weatherization for the poor. But also, there's an effort afoot to broaden weatherization to the middle class, to make it easier for, uh, you know, we do a lot for, for, the rich can take care of themselves, and we do a lot for the poor. The middle class is just sort of left on its own. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an organization in Rutland, uh, the Rutland area, called uh, Heat Squad, for example. And they, they do not just focus on the poor. They, they focus on getting uh, 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 audits, energy audits, to middle class families, and uh, arranging for credit, which will ultimately save money. So um, I, I, I'm pushing for that. And, it, and it meant on the appropriations, we've been identified with certain uh, issues. And, and uh, weatherization, the other uh, environmental issue, what we think is the, the achievable one, is to, to push for more electrification of transportation. That's, that's my brother Kurt's initiative, is what's something he's pushing. Not as though he invented it, but he's, he's trying for it. Uh, an angle on electric vehicles that I had not thought of. We got a bargain on a Prius, so I'm driving a, a hybrid now. And uh, there is this sort of phony class issue with any environmental issue. The assumption that only rich people are environmentalists. And, uh, and I drive the, the hybrid. Well, oh, you must be doing better than I thought. And actually, we got a real bargain on it. But uh, in any case, Electric vehicles, besides everything else, besides being cleaner, besides being saving on fuel, they're far more efficient energy uh, en engineering. If you step back and think about it, an internal combustion engine is an absurdly complicated kind of technology. You know, the 
thousands of little explosions going on in these cylinders to cause them to go back and forth, and then the camshaft so back and forth becomes turned. It's a complex, and, and it's, there's no reason that things go wrong with cars so often. Um, and and the, the electric vehicle is a far simpler technology and less prone to malfunction. Uh, so we, we've really got to be moving in that direction. In particular, electric cars, because as people point out, mass transit, which is a far better approach than anything on transportation, uh, we have a problem with that in a rural state. And we are the most rural population in the country. If you take, if you take the, the square mileage of a state and divide it by its population, Montana, Wyoming, uh, Alaska are far more rural on average than Vermont. But though their people tend to be concentrated in population centers. Vermont has a population that is spread out more or less evenly throughout, the, not evenly, but, but, but throughout the state. There's almost no wilderness in, in Vermont. When I told my granddaughters how to get out of the woods, if you get lost. You didn't go up in the Northeast Kingdom. No, even, even there, here's a formula that will work in Vermont for a kid and will not work in northern New Hampshire. And it's very simple, find water and follow it. Just go downstream. It'll lead you to a brook, eventually you, it'll lead you to a bigger brook and there'll be a road alongside the brook follow that road downstream to the first farmhouse and you're out of the woods. As opposed to, you could get lost and starve to death in northern New Hampshire. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hundreds of miles, there's nothing there. And millions of trees. Yeah. Oh. Don't panic and follow the water. And you'll, you'll get out. But, if but you it, can find it. But in, in any case, we're, 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 the answer that people often give on mass transit in Vermont is we're too rural. I, I think that, first of all, is an overstatement. There are routes that we probably should have commuter mass transit on. But a lot of people are always going to be using their cars. And uh, that means better the, the cleaner, fuel efficient cars. Whew, I got a lot more. I haven't even talked about uh, health and welfare, but uh, I think I've talked more than my share, so I'll hand it off. May I bring up the abortion situation going on? All right. Oh, I, you're the sort of the chair. A <clears throat> uh, traditional way of functioning here is that each legislator takes a turn around, then we have to open the questions. Well, we talk for questions, I promise. So, Alice would be next, if you don't mind, just coming in the door, breathless, having run all the way up from Morlo. All right. Good morning. Um, nice to be here again. Nice Great day to drive here today. Um, Let's see. What have you already uh, gone over? You'll have to ask Richard. I don't pay no. attention. I talked about how we <laughs> <laughs> I talked about how the appropriations committee takes the appropriations out of the bills oh. and advances the bills without, and how we will be doing the balancing act. I talked about how each various issues have advocates on the appropriations committee. Mm -hmm. Then I talk about my favorites, uh, uh, family place or parent-child centers, oh, okay. and uh, environmental. Okay, great. Sandy, have you already no. taken your turn yet? No. We do, we, we do the Senate first. Oh, okay. Um, so right now I'm in the midst of, I'm on the Judiciary Committee, and I'm also on the Appropriations Committee, and I'm also chair of the um, Judicial Retention, and that is uh, this year, well, let me tell you a little bit about that. What that is, is the, by the Vermont Constitution, the legislature <coughs> reviews uh, all of our judges in the state every six years um, as to whether they should continue for another six years. The only judges that we don't, that aren't elected by the, all the judges are not elected by the people except for um, the probate judges who are elected for a four-year term and the assistant judges, or what used to be called side judges, are elected by the people. All the other judges in the state are appointed by the governor after a process that involves many people of sending names to the governor, and then the governor um, selects the best candidate he feels should be a judge. So every six years, all these judges come up for review, and including the Supreme Court justices. 
So it's on a rolling basis because not everybody's term comes up at the same time. So this year there are eight judges who are up for retention and one magistrate. The magistrates do child support and some other functions, but they're not called judges, although um, the majority of them are lawyers, but they don't have to be. Well, maybe they do have to be now. They didn't always have to be. So anyway, we have the eight judges, and we they undergo survey, surveys. Anonymous surveys are sent out to lawyers who appear before them during the year to um, court staff they work with, guardian ad litem, so the whole group of people get surveys and are asked to report back anonymously. And then, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a, like a computerized thing where you just, you check boxes on different aspects of it, and you also can rewrite um, comments. So a few of the judges, um, in the six years, of course, they've never had a job evaluation. You know, it's, it rolls around every six years, although if someone fills someone else's term because they've retired or have moved up to a different position or something, um, they their terms come up quicker than six years. In other words, the position is the term, that position of the judge. It's not that everybody immediately starts at six years unless they're starting totally new in a new term that someone left. Um, so anyways, a couple of the judges have only been there a few years. A couple of judges have been there almost five. And another, <coughs> others have been there six. So there's a, there are three judges this year who had a lot, not a lot, but um, criticisms by the persons who appeared before them. And of course, you have to weigh that as to whether they got a decision they liked or didn't like, that kind of thing, although certainly there are people who comment that say, hey, I got, I got a lousy decision, I hate it but the judge was fair. So that's coming up, and it's been, it, it's had a lot of publicity this year. A couple of people, we have a public hearing whereby anybody, anybody can come in and complain. And a couple of people did, um, a couple of young women actually. And their, their uh, complaints were fairly substantial in terms of um, what, what they had to say. And we also had comments from the anonymous survey. So this has been going on now for a while. And when we get back to the legislature <coughs> in January, we start this reviewing all that came in. Over, Dick and I are on this. Dick is on this too. There are eight of us, four from the House, four from the Senate. And we get all the materials that have come on in over the summer. They also submit um, financial information. They also submit health information. They also submit samples that they've done in actual court cases and send those decisions in. So we've been reviewing all this material. It's taken a lot of time, which is, which is what the deal is all about, so we can make a fair and accurate vote when we come to voting. So of the one judge, it's, I have to think of this as it's, it's a new age in terms of the Me Too movement, in terms of anti-bias, in terms of um, transparency. And some of these judges haven't recognized their, the three that have complaints are, are men. And they, um, perhaps they haven't, they haven't recognized some bias. And although, although um, some of it was, they thought, anti-women, um, we've got a lot of them, the same judge says, well, this person's anti-men. <laughs> he doesn't like male litigants, you know, or he, so it's like, so the, anyway, all the judges that have come up have all gotten, this particular judge, Judge Hoare, um, he had quite a few, quite a few um, complaints about him. Nothing, no, um, nothing that would shock anybody, but you know, how he, how he perhaps acted in the courtroom. And also, we had great ones. So anyway, we're going through that process now. The, our committee, the eight of us, have already voted. And we voted for all of the judges. One judge did receive one no vote. The three judges, who had, of the three judges that had the complaints, two we asked to do um, a recommendation, what they would do to, what would we call it? Um, fix. Fix the problems in simple terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they've written a contract, and there's a superior court judge, Judge Grierson, superior, he's the chief judge for all over all the judges. And they've written agreements to be mentored by other judges, to take training courses in the area where they had weaknesses, and to have the, the judges who will mentor them and report to Judge Grierson, the chief judge, 
are um, retired judges themselves, so they're not just somebody coming in and saying, you know, I think the guy's great or I think the guy's terrible. So it's retired judges and they'll be reporting back to Judge Grierson for one, a year and a half and seeing how they do and, and also taking some courses that they knew they needed and um, so we'll see. If they, the now the next step is um, we're presenting them on Wednesday to the combination meeting of the General Assembly. In other words, the House and Senate are voting together and one in the, well, we go into the House of Representatives and we all vote there. It's a secret ballot and each one of us on the committee presents information about the judge and then the whole body votes. So I, th I think that, um, I think the plans that the two judges have written are, are well done, seem to cover everything. And we've had this happen before with other judges who have never had like a job evaluation and this the first time they get a lot of um, bad marks, so to speak. And then when they come back um, six years later, they've really matured into the job and also have corrected these flaws. So we've seen it happen. I know some of those judges that that happened to, um, have become excellent judges and really, you know, were really very, very good for the system. One who we all voted against um, withdrew his name from being retained. So that's what's going on. Geneva's not here. That's it. Sarah, Sandy. Good morning. Um, so. Um, as Dick mentioned, we're, we're at the point where things are, are really moving. Um, I counted up, I think there were 30 bills on the floor in the House last week um, because everybody's getting the bills out of committee and now they're coming to the floor. Um, my committee finished its work on the, um, on the child care bill. I think I talked about that a little bit. We were thinking about it before. Um, I consider this the biggest piece that we've done this year. Um, this is an issue, it's funny, I. I remember when I first came to the legislature writing up the, um, the absurdity of a program that had, had federal guidelines for, for what year you look, which, which poverty, poverty chart you look at, whether you look at the current one or one that's 10 years old, and then and that's one, one way that you figure out who's, who's entitled um, to, to a benefit and at what level. And then the actual rate is set with respect to a study of market rates, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And again, that was, so both of those were way out of date. So we, so when I started, we had a program that wasn't working because we were using we were using out of date poverty guidelines and we, we were using out of date market um, rates for, um, for, for childcare. So if you get half of what it cost about 10 years ago, you're not getting anything that's very helpful. Um, so the way the market rates are done, this is a little tricky to understand, but it's, it, it's they call it the 75th percentile. So, so the, they do a study of what does it cost to buy, um, to, to buy, if I have a three-year-old, what, what, are, what are all of the, the providers in the area charge for three-year-olds? And, and I should be able, with, with, if I get 100% subsidy, I should be able to afford 75% of whatever the market is in the area. So not the most expensive, but, but I should have a choice of places to go if I, if I get 100% subsidy. So as I said, we've been working, we've been in this place where, where the, both the measure of, of who qualifies and how much they get have been out of date. Um, right now, um, under current law, uh, we did, in fact, bring up the, um, the rate for infants and toddlers to uh, 2017, a couple years ago, because people just couldn't find any place to, to send their babies. People, people were having to leave the workforce because they couldn't find co um, um, care for their, their babies. Um, but, we still, but, but once the child turned three, um, then, then, we, but then we jumped back to um, 2008 market guidelines. So from 17 back to 8 and people would suddenly, suddenly discover that once again they couldn't afford what they were doing. Um, this has been on the radar for the legislature for several years. Every year you guys talk about it in appropriations. Every year we say, oh gee, we have to do something about this and they, they, they find a little bit of money and they do something. For instance, the, the bump for, for infants and toddlers. 
Um, but there has been, you've probably even seen in the news, um, there's a group called Let's Grow Kids. Um, there mm -hmm. are various, various um, advocacy organizations. They are funded by a philanthropic group called the Permanent Fund. Um, and, and they have launched an all-out campaign, so you, that's why you've been seeing ads everywhere, to try to a, a, raise public awareness of this issue, and B, try to create some momentum for change in, in Montpelier. Um, and, um, and the governor finally decided this year that it was time, and he put, um, he, he put a proposal in his budget. Um, we had a number of people in um, the House Oh gosh, I think there were 60 who signed on to the plan that had been designed by this, this advocacy group that I'm talking about that was much more ambitious. Um, and, um, and so all of those, those bills came to my committee along with, with four others. So we, had, we had six bills altogether that had various uh, ideas about how to address this issue. Um, and what we did was we looked, we went through all, all six bills, and then we and then we picked up a blank piece of paper and we wrote our own bill. Um, and the goals of the bill that we wrote were to increase capacity because right now that right now people are calling are trying to get a reservation for their babies before they even are are conceived. Certainly, certainly they do. The, as soon as they find out they're pregnant. They, they call up and try to get on a waiting list, and it still doesn't work. They still have to wait six months. Um, so capacity, so what I call capacity, which is just, is there, is there, are there enough places for the children who need care? Um, affordability, which goes back to the market rate thing I talked about earlier. And then the other piece, the other big piece is workforce. Um, because uh, child care is um, traditionally a low paid occupation, uh, you don't, you don't get people to come to, to sign up, and you don't get them to stay very long when they do. Um, and when they finally figure out what they're doing, then they go into the public school system, which pays a whole lot more. So, so there, there's been a problem with just just keeping enough people in centers. So we have we have places now that have a licensed capacity of let's say 60, but they can only take 30 kids because they can't get a staff. To take the other thirty, so it's it's a so so workforce is a huge problem. Um, what I think, what I found most interesting about this process that I'm describing, is that after we went through all of the ideas that had been that we had been laid on the table, we discovered that the governor's proposal looked pretty good, um, and um, in fact, the um, the child development division um, has um, a, a five-year plan for how they're going to improve. Um, improve the availability, the quality, um, of, and, and the affordability of child care around the state. And, um, and so our bill basically um, takes most of their ideas for what to do in year one. Um, and very specifically what that would do is it would bring, um, uh, we would use current um, current federal poverty um, levels, and in, in our bill, we would make that statutory. So um, that it would mean that that was that that was that that's the presumption every year is that that's where you're going to start. Now I do have to remind everybody that one legislature can't bind another, um, and so um, what happens is that um, in 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 the legislature, the word notwithstand is a transitive verb. And we notwithstand things all the time. So, so we, you know, we have lots of we have. Um, the, my favorite is the rule on uh, the um, uh, support for the from from Vermont Housing and Conservation. Um, there is a statutory amount that's supposed to go into that, and for I believe it's the last 25 years, the the budget has said notwithstanding what we said in 1988. We're not going to do that. We're going to do something different. So, so we can't we can't bind a future legislature. But we believe that by putting that by saying you have to use current poverty guidelines, we at least create a presumption that that's where you start. So that's the first piece that it does. The second piece that it does is that it brings the um, the market rate for those older children, the three year olds and up. Um, to um, 2015 levels. We didn't have enough money to go to 2016, but we're getting closer. 2015 is way better than 2008. Mm. 
So, um, so those are there. In addition, um, there's some money to upgrade um, the um, the uh, IT system for the department, which is critical. Um, unfortunately, most of the um, uh, information technology that we have in the state is 30 years old. It's amazing that we're working with the, I mean, we are the only business in the state probably that that doesn't have way more up-to-date um, information technology. Uh, it's, 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 always, it's always a heavy lift because they're, um, they're huge capital expenditures and we can't, we just don't have, we never have the capital to, to do it right. But this is, this has some money in it to begin to, to begin to upgrade this piece. In addition, there's another chunk of money to, um, to work on um, workforce. So um, some will be scholarships for people who are taking uh, courses, appropriate courses to become certified and to meet current state regulations about training. And a, another part will, will give some loan forgiveness to people who, with, with what we discovered in listening to our witnesses was that there are lots of women, mostly women, who love working with little children. That's what they would really want to love to do. But they have thirty thousand dollars in student loans, and they can't afford to do that. So if we can, if we and, and they and they and they have many of them have good training. Some of them even have teacher certificates. So if we can um, uh, pay down some of their debt, as instead of instead of increase, so that 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 would come out of a different fund than the than their boss. Um, then we can make it possible for them to have those jobs. So that's what the bill does, um, and um, that was we and, and our appropriations committee approved it last week. So it will be part of the bill. The, the budget bill is going to come to the floor this week. I don't know all the pieces of that as that I haven't seen the bill yet. They were still they were still um, doing the final pieces of it on Friday afternoon, um, and now it has to go goes through, you know, has to get printed. So, um, so that's where the budget is. Um, I want to follow up a little bit on stuff that Dick was talking about. Um, the parent-child centers. Um, the one that the one that you may be more familiar with here is is um, um, is the orange um, orange orange, orange, orange. Or, yeah or, the orange is it or, orange 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 county orange county orange county orange county, county. Orange county. Orange county. Yeah. it is orange county yeah um, uh, that's between uh, it's in Tunbridge. Um, they have um, they have a great program because one of the things that they do is that they 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 have a um, a child care program where kids come in and spend the day, but they also have they also do um, um, pre K, so they do the, they are the official um, um, pre K program for Chelsea and Tunbridge, and in addition they have some kids that come from, from other towns, including Bethel, um, and. We work. One of the other things that we did in my committee when we when we did uh, when we gave our feedback to appropriations on on other pieces of the budget, uh, we pushed hard to try to make sure that they didn't lose any ground. That it's interesting that there's a so there are I think there are 14 parent-child centers around the state. They are um, they are allied and they work together and they've been what they've been trying to do is trying to get their base funding. I've talked before about what I call our community partners. These, uh, the Parent Child Center is the is is a prime example of, of community partners. Government have we have if we if we care about keeping children safe, we what we do is some some of that we actually delegate to others and we do it we do it with contracts, but then we underfund the contracts and and the Parent Child Centers are very much in that category. So they have some base funding, um, and they have been asking to increase their base funding. And in fact, the governor's budget would have cut their funding from what it was last year. So we've been fighting just, 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 just to try to keep them whole from where they were last year. I don't know whether we're going to be able to add anything to that. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I think I'll stop there. Can I just say one thing in response to Sandy? So Sandy you mentioned the interesting word "notwithstanding." And of course, people in this area might be interested because in notwithstanding the Vermont Housing, the money that the Vermont Housing Conservation Board is supposed to get on, the, you know, when you transfer a piece of property, sale, sell it, whatever, the money goes, a portion, a piece of the money goes into the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. And 
they never get their full amount. But they also have been very generous in terms of helping out, for instance, in Irene, they, their money can be used for land purchases and, and things like that, and also, to, anyway, during Irene, I forget how many millions and millions of dollars they took out of that fund so it could be used, you know, for all the things that happened in Irene, so it's been a great help. Good morning, Allison. So that was just all I wanted to say was how much that fund helped in the Irene mess. You're just in time. Sorry, we had a bit of a domestic meltdown this morning. Oh. <laughs> real life happens to real people. <laughs> and this chair is like the dicey chair, too. Uh, like, uh, we're, we're there's there's one here. There's one over here. That's OK. It's, I, this chair is a rocker. Uh -oh. <laughs> so fall out the window. <laughs> you know, I'm going to hold on to you. We're going to go together. <laughs> we've, we've heard from uh, our, our other senators. And, Have you uh, heard from Sandy? Yeah, we've heard from Sandy. Great. So you are. I have nothing to add. They're all brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we've had a very busy crossover time. Yeah. I just am writing about it for my article. I mean, it's. The amount of work that we're getting through the hose is a lot. And it ranges from oh, transparency and hospital, you know, from Dick's committee, transparency and hospital pricing and and uh, emergency room surprise billing yeah. to clean up, you know, miscellaneous banking and elections bills to Indigenous Peoples Day to Firearm safety stuff. I mean, we've done. It's been a, a, a lot. And my brain is completely full of it. We still have another week of it, when, which will end with the budget coming over to us. So it's. And then we get started with that. And then you get started with that, and the rest of us deal with all the house bills that have been coming through. Great hand. Yes. Um, and the House has passed even more bills. I, you know, they, they, there, a lot of work is coming to us to uh, address from the House. So it is a, 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 fulsome, a fulsome and busy time. I have on the floor this week, uh, we have two big housing bills, one of which will be interesting to see how it does, given what's happening with the bond market last week. You, I'm sure many of you heard the reports on the economy and some of the concerns with what's happening. Um, but we have uh, um, our last housing bond was so successful. As you know, we have a dearth of housing, uh, uh, affordable and workforce housing in the state. We could do with 5,000 more housing units a year. And we just, and so there are two initiatives, there are three initiatives really that are going to uh, hopefully boost and create more housing. One is uh, doing another housing bond. The last housing bond for we bonded for 35 million. It ended up being 37 million as a result of all the work around it. And that is, we hope by the time it's done, we'll have created about 700 new housing units. Uh, the 50 million dollar bond that we're contemplating doing additionally this year, we hope will create over 1,200 new housing units. One of the things that's concerning us is the cost of housing. Uh, so we have a study going forward about why it costs so much in Vermont to build and what are the challenges that we face in the cost of housing. Um, the other housing bill uh, addresses rental health and safety, rental uh, improving rental code inspections, uh, creating a uniform uh, way that, uh, as you know, health, I think you're the health officer here in Bethel. I remember this. And that, around the state, that is mostly, but. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't remember why. Oh, I remember why. Dogs. Well, but it's, we rely on volunteers to do uh, some very contentious work with health and safety in rental housing. Uh, volunteers having to go and deal with. Uh, a whole range of issues that they aren't necessarily well equipped to deal with. And um, we put together the rental housing 
uh, advisory board to address what we could do about that. They've made some recommendations. We're going to be implementing uh, them and uh, uh, trying to consolidate it in the Department of Health in a more effective way. Uh, we're also, so to create more housing, we're also looking at a proposal the governor has made to take a million dollars uh, and create small grants, five to seven thousand dollar grants as uh, leveraging incentives for vacant and blighted properties for uh, uh, rental units that are, that are not online at the moment, aren't being able to be used because they're just in such terrible shape. And this is for weatherization and for fixing them up and uh, a percent, I can't remember what it is, would have to go to affordable, the affordable workforce housing group. I mean, people who were uh, affordable housing. Um, and then the, oh, I know, those are the, those are the major ones that, I'm, trying, I'm just blanking on other ones. <laughs> You have other ones? Yeah, no, I've already spoken. I'm just trying to. Well, we can open it to questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, just questions may be a good way to start today. Um, let, let everyone know that there is there is at least one seat here. Oh, we're going to get these in there? No, I have to leave. Okay. okay. I, I don't like saying we We could put the chair. Hi, hey, how are you? There's a second chair. You can bring it up there. <coughs> sit out there if you want. Hey, Eddie, how are you? Do you want that? Somebody grab that. It would be nice if that chair could go out there. Well, I want to talk about this abortion. It hasn't been brought up yet, and it's one of the most emotional things going on in our state. Um, not one of the senators, nor Sandy Haas, who was part of writing the bill, talked about it. Um, so it's a very serious issue that the state should um, really take a look at. I talk to people in Bethel, Rochester, whether they're Democrats, progressives, communists, and um, this House 57 bill is is barbaric. Roe race uh, since Roe and Wade versed each other, technology has outpaced what I call the coat hanger. Okay, these are just five examples, each coat hanger representing technology of choice. I am pro-abortion before the heartbeat. A woman can make a choice of contraception, IUD, or whatever the heck it's called, the pill, the day after pill, she has, and her partner has so many choices to make before the heartbeat. After the heartbeat, I think it's premeditated murder. You heard the governor of Virginia speak about leaving behind a, a, a baby born, a botched abortion, and they leave the room and let the day, baby die comfortably. So my question is this. If the abortionists can leave a room with an infant left to die, how about the mother that accepts the child and goes home with the child and decides she doesn't want it. And she takes it into her garage and lets it freeze to death. And her neighbor finds the baby. Would that mother be accused of murder? This is barbaric. It's 2019, and we're still allowing this kind of barbaric, god-awful murder. I, again, I, I believe, and I truly, in my heart, people get into trouble, they make mistakes, I get it, but the mistake of taking a child after the heartbeat under God's name is murder. And, and the question is? There is no question. The question is, I would like to ask each one of you senators how you're going to vote on this bill. Well, yes or no? Are you pro? Absolutely. I am pro-choice. You're pro-choice. Pro -choice. The House voted 106 to 36. To Have you looked at Mr. Bill. Merger's case and down in Alabama? I, That's I'm not dealing precedent? with Alabama. I'm dealing with Well, Vermont. it's a precedent. I, look, if you're asking a question, then we'll answer it. Well, wait. You were about a half an hour late, OK? Well, you just you haven't asked the question yet. Do you uh, said, do we support I'm it? Asked, you, said, yes. you, you, you support abortion after the heartbeat. 
Absolutely. There Why? is no provider in Vermont that does third term abortions. And absolutely, I support but as why would you, the why vast would you, majority. Why of would Sandy Hodge promote, promote a rule, a bill that allows late term abortions? If you keep saying they don't do it, we are codifying what is currently practiced in Vermont. Well, it's sick. It's been there for four years, though. Well, uh, so has, has the it devil. been done? Has it been done? Well, no. what is it, the, why write a rule if it's an obsolete okay. rule that hasn't been done for okay, four so years? Why do we so, have to so even? I talked about this extensively last month, uh, right. as everyone will remember. Right. Um, and um, the yes, uh, Allison is, is correct. What the bill does is is proposed to codify existing law. It happens that in Vermont um, there are no providers who do abortions in the third trimester because there are so few. People have to go to Boston or someplace where there are specialists. And why does anybody want to have a, a, an abortion in the third trimester? Reasonable question. It's because of catastrophic problems with either the fetus or the mother. They are every single story, and there are not a whole lot of them. Every story is, a, is an individual tragedy. And we heard about a couple of those. Uh, you asked about the status of the bill. Um, it was passed in the House, and it is now in the Senate, and I believe the Senate will take it up. As we've been talking about crossover, the way we work is that we work on our own bills into the crossover, and then after crossover, we take up the bills that came over from the other body. So you know, on the House side, we'll be starting to work on Senate bills, and on the Senate side, they'll be starting to work well, on we, House bills. We know what the house, where the House stands. We, uh, we know where one Senate stands. I serve on the Health and Welfare Committee. I focused on appropriations earlier, but I serve on Health and Welfare. H57 is uh, on our wall, which is to say it is pending. Uh, I don't know if we're even going to take it up because we passed, uh, this last week, we passed an amendment to the Vermont Constitution to establish reproductive autonomy as a constitutional right under the Vermont Constitution. Uh, and the reason for doing that is uh, we had thought that a lot of questions were resolved by the Roe versus Wade decision. Uh, but the American, uh, American, the United States has elected as its president uh, Donald Trump, who very repeatedly and clearly promised that if elected, he would appoint Supreme Court justices who would repeal Roe versus Wade. So it is a very reasonable thing to anticipate. In particular, where one of the uh, justices who supports Roe versus Wade is in her 80s and is <coughs> battling life-threatening illnesses and so on, uh, uh, rather heroically, is that it's, it's very likely that Roe versus Wade will be overturned or, more likely, will be interpreted in ways that make it less protective of women's autonomy. And so Vermont is a pro-choice state, and what we are proposing is that we express that in uh, the um, uh, state constitution. Uh, we have a long tradition in this state of, of privacy. Good fences make good neighbors, and uh, of respect for one another's domain, private domains. And if, you know, the, the, the idea is that, that uh, if, if privacy means anything, Certainly, autonomy over your own body uh, it means that uh, the government can't search your house without a warrant. You know, they, they need uh, and, and the state and the, the um, to talk to some of the extreme cases you, you've mentioned. The, uh, the the wording of the amendment has it that that the state can interfere in reproductive decisions where there is a compelling state interest, which is a term of art. That's a legal term, a compelling state. Uh, the, the example I owe, and this comes up in the, in the, the, the issue of guns, it's the same kind of thing, is that you, you, people have constitutional rights, but I have a right to organize a protest march. I don't have a right to have a protest march on I-89. <laughs> okay, and similarly, that, that the agree, probably this amendment would allow for outlawing truly, truly egregious behaviors, 
But even there, when you're talking about extreme situations, uh, generally what we have done as regarded these heartbreak, you know, the, the, the fetus has no brain, that kind of thing. It has no, no upper brain. It has, has the brain that controls uh, heartbeat and breathing, but no, well, not, you know. Uh, I mean, there are grotesque, heartbreaking situations that people face that we respect that that's up to the person, the citizen, and the doctor, that it's a medical decision. And you don't want the government meddling in, 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 um, in personal decisions and medical decisions. So in, in any case, um, what will happen with that amendment, I don't know. Uh, I support it. I voted for it in the committee. I'll support it on the floor. Um, I expect it would, would pass the, the Senate, but I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone has actually counted heads or counted votes yet. Um, should H57 come up as, as well? Again, there, there is agreement that, that H57 will be taken on. I mean, there's agreement we're going to, uh, uh, by, from leadership, that we will be addressing both the amendment, uh, the constitutional amendment, and the H57. Don't, they don't, they don't tell me anything. Who owns the body parts? Who owns no, no, the body I mean, they, parts they, they after talk. the child's aborted? Like, uh, does anyone? So the child comes out with parts and pieces. The fetus. The fetus. Well, let's use proper. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But who has? Control and security on where those go. Do you know that answer? Like, can the, can those pieces just be packed up and shipped to uh, uh, for stem cell research? Who who controls that part of it after it's all over and the mother goes home and we've got a little bag with the fetus in it? What do they do? Put it in a garbage can or do they flush it down the toilet? They're the questions that maybe you people should uh, think about before you start writing bills. What go but it's like we're all concerned about how to sort our trash and make sure we, yeah. our, our plastic goes here and our glass goes there. Well, how about a, how about a baby, a dead Think, baby? Uh, thinking uh, about those things is part of how we write so bills. Yeah, we should think about it before really? we write bills. Well, yes. No, yeah, we, no. I'm, what we, uh, what we do is we spend, we spend, we spend uh, most of our time in committee taking testimony and reading documents and, and debating back and forth and trying and resolve. <laughs> and bills are rarely passed in the form in which they're introduced. It's, uh, well, I would we suggest do. everyone that's involved in writing the bill should get the paperwork that the mother signs before she goes in for her abortion and understand what those, all the, all the legalese going on within that form she signs off before the surgery is done. And I agree, well, with, I agree with Sandy. I agree with Sandy with regards to late-term abortion for God bless the mother or a child or both who are ill. I totally agree with that. I agree with pro on the pro-abortion before the heartbeat for a healthy mother. But again, it comes back to modern-day choices that a woman has before they even decide to have intercourse. I mean, you know you what know? you think. Don't you think <laughs> other people should have the right to ask questions? I haven't heard anyone else comment. Yeah, we haven't heard from Alice, so it's Alice's turn. Okay, so I was an adoption social worker for 27 years for the state of Vermont. I have dealt with incredibly sad situations whereby someone is expecting a child and may make a plan for adoption. They may not. I don't have any, I never had any say over that. They came to me and I provided a service. So I certainly have seen every kind of circumstance that comes about. And I also did adoption of older children and people who weren't able to care for their children at all. Also uh, children who were abused. And there are all kinds of situations that occur in Vermont and elsewhere, of course. But I think the thing of it is, I certainly saw situations where, um, you know, abortions were were the best option for a person. Not that I was going in that direction, but that's their choice. So with regard to these bills, I do support abortion. Um, I don't support, uh, there is a law about you can't have a partial birth of law, abortion, which is not a partial birth. Um, what do you yeah, call it? Yeah, that, that's, 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 what the federal, that's what the federal law says hasn't been in my committee. Um, so partial birth abortion, that is forbidden under federal law. But in terms of an abortion to save the life of the mother, it has to happen sometimes. I agree. So there I agree with that. But so that's casual the abortion that's just, the answer. just to uh, eradicate something they don't want. I, I I agree with you, Alice, with you know a, a serious health issue or something like that. But not recreational sex, and all of a sudden the girl's pregnant. There, there, you know what? There are no casual abortions. It is a, a tough decision for every parent, for the father, for the mother. Mm -hmm. It is a huge decision. 
to, to terminate a pregnancy. And nothing is done casually. Nothing. How many cases do we deal with about this particular problem in Vermont? Thousands, a hundred? No, um, uh, the number, I think the number okay. in the last, the, I, I had all this last month, I'm sorry. Um, in uh, the 2016 is the last year that we have um, uh, health department statistics and it was 1,100 total in the state of Vermont, of, of, of Vermont residents. Nationwide, it's 881,000. And that does include California, uh, I think it's Maryland and New Hampshire. 881,000. It's a lot. Where do they all go? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I, I feel you're spending an enormous time, uh, amount of time and money for 1,100 people or 1,100 names or whatever. Uh, where there are more problems, more burning problems in the state than 1,100 people. The first one is the, well, old, the elderly people, which are a lot more... How many, I don't know how many times. We are capable of walking <coughs> and chewing gum at the same time. The well, I don't know, doubt that. I often hear this about issues. Why are you dealing with this instead of dealing with that? <coughs> we're not dealing with it instead of dealing with other yeah. things. It's among the things we're dealing with. Okay, I mean, it's, it's uh, believe me. But it seems that it's always, these are the things that have surfaced, and the most important, at least to a lot of people, are not dealt with anything. So I but they are that dealt with, Nick. The, the, the idea that, that we're dealing with this instead of dealing with other things is simply not true. Well, and how I want to add something. How, how, many, how much taxpayer money so went in to pay for them? Same question. I want to answer, I want to I follow up with, with Nick. Yes, you're right. There were 1,100 women in 2016 who actually got an abortion. But in fact, I've heard from lots and lots and lots of women who are much younger than I am that they want to see this right preserved. So we are not talking about something that only affects the people who actually, in the moment, say that they're going to do it. Because a lot of people who say they want to have the right when the time comes will say, you know what, I think I'll just have this child. That happens a lot. But, but having the choice is what people want, and I have heard that loud and clear. And what, what I think was most interesting to me, because I grew up in the years, in the days of back alley abortions, and I know people, I, I had a friend who had to fly to Mexico. She happened to she happened to be in a in a well-to-do family, and she could do that. Poor poor people didn't have that choice. So some of the poorer people just ended up dead. And and what we have now is we have a, a, a huge generation of women who have never known the law to be different. They they believe this was this was part of the of the America that they were born into, and they want to see this right preserved. And they are, and some of them are like, oh my God, I can't believe what might happen with the Supreme Court. So we, those are the people that we are protecting, and it's way more than 1,100. Well, um, uh, Senator uh, Nick, um, in reference to uh, 169, what and talks, that? uh, that's in the Judicial wow. Committee, in reference to the 12-hour waiting period. Uh, uh, you are the vice chair, and uh, since we're talking about life issues, uh, you had some deep thoughts in that discussion with uh, uh, Joe Benning uh, that you both voted recently no uh, in the committee, and the subject matter was, well, if uh, Vermonters want to commit suicide, you know, a gun is a good option. Now, Who said that? Hmm? Who said that? That was part of your discussion. And, well, that's, well no. that's how it was reported I, by I John Walker. I never said okay. a gun is a good option. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. It is an option. Okay. I'm sorry uh, for using uh, good. Let me clarify where that was. Okay. okay. But just a minute. Let me just okay, finish. the question. Well, what came to my mind was our right as elderly folks to be able to have a healthy uh, assisted suicide, if that's our choice. So that uh, what is a healthy suicide is uh, the 12-hour waiting period, 
not to have it and run down by a gun sticking our mouths below ourselves against the wall and who's going to find us? Or do we have the right to a healthy assisted suicide? But you know, that subject came involved in, in deciding if you're going from a 24 hour to a 12 hour. And as the end of the result, both you and... Well, 48 hour to 24 to, hour. To, no, to 12 hour. No, 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 we've ended up with a 24, 24 hour. Well, 24 hour, but it does, you know, but in that subject matter, the suicide issue came in. I'm glad you asked a question. Thank you. So in our committee was, uh, I don't remember the, the number because we one six go by the name of the bill. So there was a bill to um, have a 48 hour waiting period. And there were several other gun bills in our committee. So um, the decision by the committee was to combine all these bills into one. Not, not my decision, but anyway, they all were combined into one. One was um, the gun, safe gun storage was with the waiting period. And also uh, what got combined with that was a very sensible piece that had to do with last year with regard to the gun bills that passed, there was a ban on bringing a certain size magazine into the state. And in fact, what that did was prevent the police in New Hampshire when they come in to assist, like the Carl Drake, a big situation farther north, that they wouldn't be able to bring their, their, so their get magazines bigger than that in with those guns. So that sort of said, hey, this is crazy, because if the <coughs> Hampshire police are being called in to help Vermont in a situation or chase somebody into the state, they wouldn't be able to have that gun with that magazine. But anyway, <coughs> all these bills got combined. What I did say was, some people, in other words, we do have um, medically assisted um, death with dignity, or what's the new name that it's called? Oh, medically assisted. Medically uh, assisted um, death with dignity. In other words, you're on your last legs and you have the right to go and get a prescription by going to two doctors to take that and have a peaceful death. That, that passed a number of years ago. So that, in effect, that really is suicide too. We don't like to call it that, but. So what I would like to say about that is that um, I've known several men in my community, three of them who were in the very late stages of cancer. They have had guns all of their lives. They've been hunters. They've been comfortable with guns. And I know three people over the years, and I've lived there a long time now, who have just, and one very recently, a, a man my age, who decided that they would end their lives. They had had all the treatment they could get, this fellow, um, guy I knew quite well, decided on his own. He wasn't going to go to two doctors anymore. He'd been through every doctor's. He'd been through every kind of treatment. He went to his favorite fishing spot, and he shot himself. And so that was his choice, and I have absolutely no problem with it. If that's you know what the fellow was facing, he didn't want the death with dignity piece or all of that stuff. He wanted to be where he was comfortable and, and end his life the way he felt he should. And so I don't have any problem with that, but that is considered suicide, of course. And so the, um, anyway, so that's that. The, so you do have a right already to kill yourself. And the, so the 48 hour um, waiting period down to 24 was a compromise with the, um, some of the people that wanted the 48. Phil Baruth who put in the bill was in our committee. The other thing is I voted against it. Not that I didn't like certain parts of it, not that you might not be able to, it was for handguns only, it wasn't for rifles. Um, and in the end, that's the compromise one. It was for rifles originally. So it got down to 24 hours for a handgun. Anyway, I voted against it. I was not comfortable with what happened in the House last year. There were four gun bills. I voted for three. I didn't vote for the fourth. And the reason I didn't was it got amended on the floor with all kinds of things, and including that piece that New Hampshire or New York State, anybody that had it, officers coming in to help you wouldn't be able to bring that magazine with that gun into the state. It also has to do with, um, if it had been, my thought was, if it had been studied in the committee, in the House, there could have been a compromise that could have worked, but it wasn't. It was amended on the floor. It wasn't studied. The piece is about the uh, magazines. I mean, I don't, you know, these great big and orange magazines, you know, collectors do have those and should be allowed to have them. They have special permits to have them. But as it turned out, um, a Glock 9, I'm trying to remember this from last year, 
which the um, police usually have. A lot of, there's a lot of gun manufacturers, surprisingly, in Vermont. I think there's about 54 or so. And the issue was with regard to, because it was done on the floor, it put in place a clip that goes with the um, block nut, a clip that the ban on the nut, number of bullets in the clip was at a number that's not compatible with the Mach 9. I think that's 17. Maybe someone here is more knowledgeable it comes because I've forgotten some of this stuff. And they put in a 50 and it needs a 17. So it made a huge problem in terms of gun manufacturers and selling selling in Vermont or when they have a contract with, say, uh, this out of state company, that that's the number that they want. So they could manufacture it, sell it to them, but they can't, when they have a contract with the police, they usually take back all of the guns that they have, and they were replaced with these new guns. So it was a lot of information that was available last year, which has escaped some of us my mind at this point, since we've got a lot of other stuff going now. But, um, so that's the deal. So I voted against it. I didn't, I didn't want it to be amended on the floor of the House that way. And that's the process, and that's likely to happen. And I think you know this bill that did pass will very likely be changed in the House. So I'm done with I'm done with that. Thank you. Uh, uh, my concern was just the philosophy of you know using a, a gun for suicide. Maybe maybe the state should look into the education of if that's your choice for suicide. Maybe it would be a good idea to have uh, uh, someone there if, to clean up the mess afterwards. Well, I'll tell you something. An old guy dying of cancer who's been using a gun all his life and decides to kill himself. He doesn't need education. So there you go. I wasn't referring to that. I was referring to <clears throat> the issue of if people are going to commit suicide with guns, maybe it's it should be appropriate educationally wise that it's okay to let other people know you're going to do that so that they can deal with it. Mm -hmm. They take right. your guns away probably. They take your guns away probably. Oh, well, you can't do that. No, if, it, if you decide that suicide by gun is okay. I think also know families who have taken guns out of their home when they thought that their person with cancer might shoot themselves. Since how we're on gun bills, um, I didn't. I wasn't aware that we were going to have new gun bills this session because I was thinking that everybody thought that they had covered it in the previous session. I was, however, happy about the tremendous amount of testimony that we were able to give and get a chance to speak on it this time around versus last time there wasn't really the opportunity to have as much public speak in. And I'm also pleased with the amount of consideration that was put in and compromised into the bill, although I still disagree with the bill. Um, and I think that there's some other issues that maybe they may even be able to amend in the House when you changed it to uh, from a 48 to a 24 hour waiting period on handguns only i was my thoughts would be for a first time buyer only why restrict somebody's rights that's already purchased guns has guns if and their reasoning was suicide well if the people somebody that's not a first time buyer they already have the access and the weaponry if they wanted to do that, that they could. So, so it that just, was disgusting. It would protect uh, more law-abiding citizens' rights by if it was amended to only first-time yeah. buyers, which would be a violation of their rights, but not so, so much. Hard to calculate and enforce. That came up and was discussed yeah. at length. Because so that, that when they run a background check, it would determine how many, whether they'd purchased previous firearms or not. There's, uh, they know how many you have and how many you don't have on the new right. laws today. So I was pleased with the amount of consideration that was put into it and the compromise and stuff. I was happy with that. It was just, I would still be against the bill, but. So Wayne was talking about, we had our Judiciary Committee held a public hearing in Randolph at Vermont Tech. Shoot, I think that was two weeks ago. Yeah. And, you know, everybody was invited to come in. It was very well attended. It was, BTC did a great job of um, setting it up and welcoming people. And, security in case there was a problem. So. Oh, and anyways, back to my question. I know where you stood on the bill where you voted on it. I just would like to know where the rest of you... I was one of the sponsors you of sponsored the, the 48 hour period and safe storage. I have, a, sadly, a lot of experience with suicide by firearm. The most notable one was, of course, our beloved uh, professor at Vermont Law School, Cheryl mm -hmm. Hanna, who, uh, uh, as we all know, suicide can, uh, even with people with deep depression who have managed to wade through tough times before, 
when firearms are involved, they're far more likely to actually make that suicide attempt f fail. I mean, and Cheryl is, uh, I think, the, the suicide that is, had the biggest impact in terms of firearm and the ability to buy it and then go immediately kill yourself. Um, we, we know that suicides, if, that, uh, that firearms just make them that much more lethal. Uh, and we also know that most people survive suicide attempts and go on to live full lives uh, when firearms are involved. Almost never. Just my um, And let me just finish. And the, I'm very disappointed they didn't address, address safe storage. Um, I also have been involved with uh, uh, teenage, we have one of the highest teenage suicide rates by firearm in the country. Uh, and was, uh, as with my colleagues, we were uh, uh, made aware and introduced to a, a, a case up in Burlington area where a teenage a suicide, a teenager uh, who with teenagers can be very impulsive, um, had had a really tough day at school, knew a family whose firearms were uh, not locked, went in and, and, uh, sh and it took a firearm, which he, probably, he shouldn't have done, obviously, but he did, and, and killed himself. Uh, for me, safe storage, most gun owners are really good about keeping their guns safely stored. I'd, I'd really like all Vermonters to be good about safely storing their firearms, and we prevent more tragedies and uh, hopefully fewer domestic uh, violence uh, incidents as well. So I, you know, I feel strongly about safe use of guns in the state, and most of our gun owners are, are very good about that and are well educated because we have very good firearm training and education courses, as you know. Um, and we are, our job is to protect Vermonters, and this is, to me, an extension of how we protect and care for each other. Yeah. Now, you say that firearms are more fatal in a suicide, but oh, there's, uh, exponentially. there's a lot more other options. I think that Queechee Gorge <coughs> down there, they recently built a fence to try to keep people from right. jumping off of it. Now, my thoughts on if somebody is so distraught that they want to commit suicide, that would you rather have them doing it in their own home, or would you rather have them? I would them, rather have them not. Or, I would rather not have them do it as well. Yes, but so, I mean, if somebody not. was to get in a car and head on a whole other family that had any, nothing to do with their problems, sure. then you're taking more lives in an alternative methods. If somebody's so distraught that they want to do it, they're going to do it one whether it's with a gun, whether they cut their well, wrist, actually, whether they hang not, themselves, the whether case. they jump off of a bridge or a building or whether they head on into a cliff, right. a ledge or something. There's multiple ways to do it. Are we going to keep banning, are we going to ban bridges, automobiles, knives? Obviously not. Yes, but why do we keep attacking the firearm? Because Which I Which is just a constitutional already, right I, to be able to. If you would attack. listen, I, did. I shared with you that fi when firearms are involved, suicides are 90% successful, yeah. as opposed to other suicide attempts where people can uh, survive and go on to lead healthy, good lives once they have the mental health challenge they're dealing with addressed. And then probably 90% of them would have um, lifelong effects from a failed suicide attempt. Like if somebody they might was well. all broken up from jumping off of a bridge or broke their neck when that, they I can't tried to hang to. themselves and didn't finish the job or if they cut their wrist and bled out a bunch. Yeah. My, my committee got to hear the testimony about the Queechee Bridge a couple years ago when, when that came to the floor and one of the studies that was cited um, uh, uh, related to bridges in Washington DC, there's one right by the zoo that apparently was, was a favorite spot and they did, I don't remember exactly what they did there to make that um, no longer possible, and somebody said, oh, there's another bridge that's just a half mile up, people will go there. It didn't happen. They actually cut the rate of people jumping off bridges in that neighborhood. And, and it, so, so it's, it's not necessarily the case that because I can't, you know, this isn't poison, that I'm going to go find it somewhere else. It doesn't happen that way. People, it's, it's an impulsive decision. And the more time you can put between, between the impulse that this isn't worth it and, and the follow through, the greater the chance that they will think better of it. And I, I think the author, there are also statistics about people who have, who have survived and who say, oh my god, I'm so glad I survived. So it's, that's, that's what the study shows. To answer Wayne's question very briefly, I had, I, had been, I had been asked during the campaign, did I, did I anticipate any more 
uh, gun regulations, this biennium. And I uh, said that the general practice in the legislature is, is to not uh, do the same issue two biennials in a row. That having dealt with the issue once, I doubted we would bring it up again. Uh, that was not a promise not to do it. It was a prediction that it probably wouldn't happen. But it became clear to me afterwards from what people would say to me that a lot of people took that as a promise for me that I wouldn't support any more gun control. And by pointing out that I didn't actually do that, that sounded to me a lot like what's called weasel words. Politicians can sometimes just, if you pick your words really carefully, you don't say what they think you said, and it's a way of deceiving people and still be a, be a good guy. So I did not introduce any government le legislation this year. I did not co-sponsor any of the bills. Uh, and because I just didn't want people to feel I had, I knew that they disagreed with me and they were angry with me, I can, I can live with that. I didn't want them to think I had deceived them. But when the bill comes on the floor and you're sitting in the Senate, you are obligated to vote yes or no. And so at that point, the question for me is, is this a, a reasonable proposal or is it not? And it is a flawed bill. There are contradictions in it, but you've articulated some of them. But on balance, you know, they're just, just tipping the scales. I thought this policy will do more good than harm. And I am convinced that the Constitution allows for reasonable regulation, time, manner, and place, and so on. And so I voted for the, for the bill. Uh, but we haven't even settled our last gun bill from last legislation through the courts that's right. to determine how that's going to roll out on constitutional rights. And here we are presenting another bill. So I also feel Nick's frustrations with we have more worthwhile um, things that we could be helping people with, like our elderly that want to live the rest of their healthy life and that have contributed to society. And we wouldn't be here without our elders. So I would think that it would be more important to maybe try to help some of our elders um, get through their final days instead of making them feel like that they're getting an entitlement when it's their money that they paid in and stuff, and we should be more considerate of our elders, because none of us would be here without our elders. Well, I agree with your remarks about the elderly, but as far as the idea of doing one thing instead of something else, I, I think I, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. Yes, yeah. well, I just see more. Same thing, you know, I brought it up last year about the capital gains tax. Yeah. That's, I think that, that's, and here's again, I'm not referring to you or you or you that you're doing this, but the, the regulations of the state, you work all your life, you save some money, and now is the time to use this money to take care of your sick wife or yourself. And on top of that, you have to pay taxes. Recently, almost $1,000 in my tax return this year, it's a capital gains. You know, no matter what explanation you have. I didn't use that money to go to a cruise or whatever, pay medical bills and to pay care for Heidi plain and clear like that. But they won't, you know, the state won't accept that excuse. Nick, as you know, there's an active discussion about the estate tax. I do know uh, that. Uh, there is. And um, the, because the governor had proposed uh, getting rid of the estate tax, and I, I believe they have chosen to, to keep it. I, no, the last I read, they were maybe raising yeah. So, as you know, Vermont's exemption uh, is lower, and we uh, and there's a, a, a fairly large differential between what is now allowed by the feds and what Vermont, where Vermont taxes the states. And I believe we're slowly uh, bringing it up to where the feds to the feds level. We're, we're taking eight million out of the estate tax for clean water. Is what the governor proposed right. in his budget, and that's what we're working on too. What they're proposing doing away is, is the land game. Yeah, the land, that's actually in my committee, and we have not, we are not making, uh, taking action on the land game. What the, 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 the land, what? The land gains tax. tax. It, the, Which the means the profit. It, the profit if you sell your place. It was designed so you wouldn't like flip land. Or it was a conservation mode. And the, the proposal's not as well considered as we thought it needed to be. And so but we have chosen to not take action on it. It's in the ways and means at the moment. And I don't know what ways and means is deciding to do about it. So, but when he's, there's, there's not that much money anymore that comes on in from. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned about the deaths by 
by guns on us and our young people. How many have been because of overdose? I don't know. I don't serve on that on a committee where I would know that, and I don't know if we know those statistics. I think we do, but I don't have them in mind. But not necessarily intentional overdoses, but certainly some. Right. Are you asking about intentional or? or uh, no, about no. just both ways. Yeah. Way. I, I'm on health and welfare, and I, I don't. I can't pull the number off the top of my head. And, it's a lot. It's and scary. obviously it's too many. It's it's yeah. I don't think they so, I don't think they said so, well, I haven't seen numbers that separate kids and grown ups. The total the total is unacceptable. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. Terrible, terrible trend. Yes, I'd like to kind of continue. This is a pretty interesting discussion. I thank all the senators and the representative for all their hard work. Uh, Friday the fifteenth, you had a couple hundred youth visit you. Now they're making some pretty serious needs being spoken, and it kind of relates to why young people might consider, consider suicide, might consider why they consider drugs or take a gun to themselves. They need to hear from us, from you, that you're serious. Now, in March of 1936, the state of Vermont said, okay, you can't handle it in Mount Pelier, and the towns voted statewide to prevent the Green Mountain Parkway. That was done by the people of Vermont, not by Mount Pelia. Does it go, is it going to take the people of Vermont to shake up Mount Pelia on the fact that we want to see some real action on climate change? Because those kids came to you. Yeah, tell they, I mean, they, they marched all over the state, as people may know, the and left their world, the world, world, and, the world and demonstrated about a call to action but on mitigating climate I would have liked to have seen you guys go to the microphone and do some serious talking. Well, but, we were all but in committee. We committee. We were, and we were, I, I don't we care where you are. We were I don't care where you are. I don't care where you are. <laughs> we were they not, were not in school. We were not invited to speak. As a matter of fact, I know well, a grandmother that you wanted can to go with her you, grandchild. And you can say, speak. No, this is you. I know, but you can speak. I'm just saying we that, were not invited. that what they're saying is highly critical, and they're looking for leadership. I'm going to end it there. Thank you. I'll just say. Here's a young person. Yeah, the, le the legislature, like just the government in general, has failed miserably on global warming. Okay, and there are various degrees of denial. There are people who simply deny the science on global warming. I think they've more or less left the discussion. But then there are people who acknowledge the science, but don't really embrace the seriousness. And that's a kind of denial as well. And, and uh, as one of the co-chairs of, uh, of the Climate Caucus, and as a co-sponsor of Senator Clarkson's uh, uh, Global Warming uh, Bill, Carbon Bill, uh, I, I've got to say that it is very, very frustrating for me. Because it really, is, this is, and I use this term every week when I invite my colleagues to the caucus luncheon, I say, this is the overarching existential crisis of our time. And I've chosen my words carefully. Uh, I don't think I'm being pretentious with that. It is overarching. Nothing matters in comparison to it. And it is an existential crisis that, that had the planet's ability to sustain life as we know it is being compromised. And people say, why Vermont? Vermont is so small, it doesn't matter. Five of our most important economic uh, five of our most iconic businesses in Vermont are in jeopardy if we get any warmer. Mitigating climate change in Vermont is essential for us to keep the way of life we treasure, to keep sugaring, to keep the forest products industry alive, to keep uh, tourism, to keep skiing, snowmobiling, you name it. Most of the businesses we treasure and the way of life we treasure with agriculture and a, uh, a working lands landscape based economy is in jeopardy if we go any further in climate change. And we, so for me, it's, it's, uh, it's a huge economic development issue. And one, um, and I think Mason, you're absolutely right. I think that leadership is having a hard time figuring out how to incorporate. We are, we're actually, Ways and Means just took a huge step to add, to, to double the fuel tax uh, on heating fuel 
to finance much more weatherization. We have to do much more in everything. Well, and it all has to happen at the same time. And changing our culture, we are a fossil fuel dependent <coughs> culture, and we have to, it's a big turnaround, as you know. Turning right. that ship is right. a big Right, turning ship. For example, you mentioned snowmobiles. By the way, you should be talking about the state being super aggressive in creating electric snowmobiles. Why? Because we want that recreation. But when I hear you say snowmobile, I cringe because the first thing that we all recognize is that we have to eliminate recreational fossil fuel burning. That goes with the marine industry and Lake Champlain. Those need they are, the technology is here. We need to convert to electric propulsion systems. It is something we can be a leader in. I, you know, I agree. And so when you say You're snowmobile, preaching to the choir. No, 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 I, no, no, I, no, but you have to hear that little difference. You yeah. want to support vast organizations, you want to do that, but we're not yeah. talking that, about that's, what is that going pales to take. by comparison to, no. to sugar rain and forest no, products. No, it's all the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think Dick knows that. It's all the same. Well, well they're, they're all, they're not, they're not competition, they're all problems. I want to mention just another problem with global warming that I didn't know about until last week. Um, the Fish and Wildlife is trying to do away with the lottery for moose hunting because the moose population, which was growing, is decimated by a, a tick that was not native to Vermont, but has, has and is migrated. Survive? That's not only in Vermont, though. Oh, right, no. All over the yeah. state. I mean, yeah. this, uh, the, kind of, yeah. this, uh, the region, the area. Yeah. So we want to we hear from in. a moist number from... You still have your hand up? Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's protocol, but I would love if people said their names when they said things so that we all knew who each other were. But I'm Wiley, and I'm from Bethel. Um, but to speak to everything that you were saying earlier, Dick, and around um, climate change. But um, I was wondering about H-477, Representative Gonzalez, Gonzalez's bill that yeah. she put in around carbon charging, but the heat pumps and weatherization. A few all supported that. I know that sometimes other things get added to bills, but was wondering if you I supported think it as Gon it is. Gonzalez is brilliant and she's articulate. No, that's a good bill. Again, what we, we realized, that the, the Climate Caucus realized early on, is that a really significant, massive effort was not going to get a lot of enthusiastic support this session, and that we zeroed in on two achievable short-term goals. One is, is ex well, first of all, three really, maintaining weatherization for the poor, expanding weatherization for the middle class, and, and supporting electrification of, uh, of transportation. It's interesting, and it's going to tell you how it breaks down. 4% of the cars on the road are electric. Now, for me, when I found out that statistic, my reaction was, wow, we better up our game. Only 4%? That's terrible. Let's, let's get more. But Dick Mazza, who's a good guy, he's a friend of mine, chair of Senate Transportation, confronted me. He said, do you realize only 4% of the cars on the road are electric, meaning they're not a factor? We shouldn't be worried about electric cars. The exact same fact leading to two completely opposite um, uh, conclusions. We, we are not on our way to, to 90, 90 by 50, 90% uh, 11 by 50. In fact, we're losing ground. We're actually introducing more carbon than we were before. So actually that, in the Senate, the bill that is about to be introduced is um, requires that our goals be, uh, be requirements. So they're not no longer will be goals, but will be required. So every department and every agency will have that as a requirement, but they have to achieve these things by those days. And um, we are, I am recasting, uh, Diana and uh, Selena and I have been working on these carbon pricing bills. And I am in the process because we've had a, a bit of a challenge with the number of bills that have been introduced this session. Our legislative council has been a little overwhelmed so the Senate, some of the Senate bills have been, are slower to come out, and um, I am recasting uh, that exact carbon pricing bill as an economic development bill, and will hopefully come into our committee in economic development. And then will they recommend? So uh, I don't know where Deanna's bill is at the moment. It's in natural resources. Yes, it, uh, yes. and and I I, don't, I do not believe it will be well. It might it might 
It, well, it can't it can't pass this year because because we because we're past we're past crossover. But right. hopeful for uh, the biennium. Uh, uh, hopeful. But but, but, but I, I see I see Deanna's bill as as one of those things that is is like raising raising the awareness. We, um, all of us, all of us have worked on things that were that were that took m multiple years to pass, and and that's and that is that is one of those things where you get the idea out there and you get people to, to you know first they say oh no way and then they say well I'll think about it and then they say well maybe and and then finally you get to you get to yes and 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 that's the process that we're on and it's. It is frustrating for those of us who want to see want, want to see it move, but you know, the, I'll be really honest with you. The business community pushback on some of this stuff is is intense. Well, and the cultural pushback. I mean, yes, it is. It, it's not. You know, I don't know. How, I mean, I can't. I would love to be able to afford to move off fossil fuels, and I. We're not able to do that work, which is really frustrating. I think many of us would like to do the right thing, but our culture is has completely embraced functioning on fossil fuels, and uh, it is a huge cultural turnaround to move <coughs> to move heating systems, transportation systems, housing. I mean, it, it's a big shift, and we're we're gonna we have to do it to survive, and how we can afford to do it and how we can create yesable options for people. Creating yesable opportunities for business and individuals to, to help turn the ship is what we have to be able to do. And I, I'm hopeful, Lily, that we will be in a better place at the end of the biennium. Remember, it's a two-year process. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm hopeful that by the end of next year, we'll, we'll have made more progress. Another so comment over got there. It. And then okay, my, na my name's Wayne Townsend for everybody, anybody that doesn't know me. Thank I'm going to shift my uh, attention back to taxes and struggling for monitors. Um, and my question is going to be for each of you that represent us in Montpelier, this legislative session. Do um, you suppose that if we cut spending in Montpelier, instead of spending money that we don't have because I was reading that Vermont's 200 million in the behind right now that maybe we could stop adding new taxes I don't know um, where you read that through these bills I mean, now it's probably more because it's the billions with the unfunded health care pensions and retiree health care um, and pension benefits yes um, it was 200 million beyond what we have assets to cover, I believe, is what I just read in the True North. So. But however, um, if we cut spending, that maybe we could lighten up taxes so that Vermonters wouldn't struggle as much and that maybe that would cut down on some suicidal financials, a big reason for a lot of people's thoughts on that. And then instead of spending $50 million on a dwindling population, we're paying people to move to this state, that if maybe if we lightened up some of the rules and regulations and let Vermont grow a little bit in industry, that maybe people would want to come here and build houses with their own money instead of putting it onto the taxpayer and using tax dollars to build houses for people to come here for our free stuff. Yeah. Well, nothing's free. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's after nine, so like I have to be back at work. So I mean, Wayne, that's a big question, and uh, it isn't. Some of that's accurate. You're absolutely right about the pensions. We uh, have have some serious pension work we need to continue to do, but I think we're on the, the right track. The money was not put in the retiree retired teachers pension plan during those years Sorry. when the state was having a boom time. The money was not put in, so every year we have been putting ton of money and millions every year to try and catch up. And it is fully funded in terms of the current situation and has been for several years now. But it's back, back underfunding that is what's killing us in terms of some interest on that money. David? That we owe. I'm just going to make that comment. I'm going to get, get work. Um, I, think, I think it's great that everybody's talking about electrification of cars, transportation, uh, heating, blah, blah, blah. But I think you're putting a cart in front of the horse yeah. because we do not have a good way to produce electricity. We do not have a good way to dispose of, of uh, solar panels when they re reach their maturity. 
there's hazardous waste in those, in those materials. Uh -huh. yeah. And I've asked many solar providers, what are you going to do with that? Oh, I don't know, that's yours. Mm -hmm. We're going to take our money and run, and then that panel is yours. Yeah, you deal with it. So let's find a good way, because A&R, which I know somebody very, was very much involved, we cannot dam the rivers. We cannot cut the forest down, transmit electricity. All these things we cannot do. Okay, so, and, and then we look to the solar panel. Find a way to produce electricity safely, economically, and enough of it. Before you say, you gotta have this many cars, mm -hmm. you gotta have this many buses, and you gotta have this much kind of electric heat, blah, blah, blah. Let's have the electricity first. A good, safe source. I gotta go. Okay. So I take your point. point. Well, well said. Well, the other thing about what Dave said Wait, right now. I just now. wanna say one thing. In 1900, 38% of the cars in Vermont were electric. Really? Yeah, oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Right. But that was all we did. My son Peter said, why don't you look into you know, putting panels in your house? Well, the price I got was $20,000, you know, plus the, uh, no, the, uh, whatever the state will provide. So it was $20,000 and still it wouldn't provide 100% of the electricity I need. It will be 80 percent, and Peter, the genius, says, "You know how long it's going to take it to yeah. recover right. that money?" It's a young person. So what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is, everybody's pushing the let's do this, let's do this, <laughs> tax this, let's make some money, like two percent the fuel tax that came up, and then I'm not how are we going to do it by taxing only? You're, we're not getting anywhere. And the other thing too is new people. What is the program to bring new workers in the state? <laughs> they come in, and you know I heard that personally. They tax you for the, the registration for the cars is too high, the fuel tax is too high, and the pay is minimal compared to what I was doing in another state and all. So before everybody comes with those grandiose ideas. And we do need workers, you know that. I'm sure everyone yes, knows that. Workers. You know. So you can attract them by taxing them. <laughs> well, I take that as a statement more than a question. I, I take it. Yep. I hear you. Okay. I, I want to, to answer uh, the, the comment about, about cutting spending. Uh, cutting spending in the abstract doesn't really tell us anything. I need to know what it is you think we should cut. And, and I'm all ears. Believe, Believe me, I'm you all ears. ears. Why should you spend seventeen thousand dollars per student for South Rockland High School? Eighteen. Eighteen thousand. I'm seventy-seven. She's seventy-five. Yeah, but it's more, isn't it? Uh, our taxes are eight thousand dollars a year. My son moved to Tennessee, Lebanon, Tennessee. He bought a brand new house, three hundred fifty thousand dollar house, four bedroom, three bath, two car garage. His taxes are thirteen hundred dollars a year. He said, Dad, he said, I can't afford to live in a state. Well, they're trying to pass an uh, $11 million budget right now. I mean, there's petitions all over oh, yes, the town. Oh, yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. Pass yeah. Down in yeah. right. Yeah, right. yeah. so, I mean, the, the, the taxpayers have had enough, and the, the percentage of students that are being taught no. just doesn't add up. And then bringing up all the health care or child care, yeah. that's, I feel badly for all these little children. And they're not even, all that money we're putting in goes right to the top. It yeah. goes to the Board of Education, exactly. National Education, the yeah. supervisor. You get out. Yeah. I'll add to some of them areas, like back to the question of like what Dave was talking about with solar panels and stuff. We're using a lot of taxpayer dollars to fund solar and push green energy onto everybody. And then we're not even sure whether how toxic that is, who's going to be responsible for it. It's the taxpayers are the one that's putting the bill for that. There's a lot of areas that could be cut some spending. Well, I've always been going back to about 30 years ago when the town of Rand Randolph packaged all the used batteries, and put them in a box, and sent them back to the back of battery manufacturers. And these were Chamber of Commerce guys doing this. They weren't environmentalists. I've always gone with the principle, your product, your profit, your mm. problem. Mm. And I think that probably, to be fair, would apply to people uh, with solar. Uh, solar collectors mm -hmm. as well. Well, solar panels yeah. are going to be like asbestos in 20 years. Right, yeah. exactly. 
You've got an electric car. Wonderful. What's a hot person? Okay. We had a Chevette diesel back in 1980. 52 miles a gallon, and diesel. you've gone backwards. Yeah. What, are, what are your cars getting now for fuel mileage? Is it Joe? Well, Dix is getting something. I get about 52 miles. Okay, okay. I, okay. Yeah, real quick, yeah. I know we want to wrap up. Wait, 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 I, I do have a quick question, and, and I'm Lisa Campbell, and I'm, and I'm here um, covering this for the paper as well. But um, I'm interested in the in the bill about wanton waste that was in the house, and um, and I know that it, it primarily addresses. Um, things like coyote killing contests and crow killing contests and that kind of thing. And I'm not targeting hunters and I think and I think most of our hunters are very ethical, they're very responsible, but I think these contests and people, I don't know if you've looked on Facebook at all, but there are people, hunters out there who sit in front of a, you know, a dozen dead coyote carcasses and brag about how awesome they are. And I, I worry about destabilizing the populations and what that does overall to the circle of wildlife in the state. And I'm wondering about where, if it made it out of committee, if it's... Um, it is still in committee. It is um, still in committee. Um, so it won't be voted on this year because it didn't make it over across the state. So we address it next year, maybe. Um, and I say that's the, the colloquial we, it's not me personally. But I'm just wondering about where you guys stand on that kind of thing. And um, it, I realize it's a tricky balance protecting the rights of hunters and yet addressing this wanton waste. I mean, they're just killing them for the joy of killing them, which just feels very perverse to me. So I'm wondering about where folks stand on that. Personally, I'm waiting to see what the committee does with it. I, I, okay. It's, it's hard to have an opinion when you don't know what the final bill's gonna look like. Right, um, right. You know, I get the concept. And, right. And I, I think I agree with the concept. But, yeah. but as, as with all, everything like that, the devil is always in the details. Right, right. So are, are the hunts still going on? Those no. The uh, the con we 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 banned contests. Oh, I was waiting for you to jump in. Contests, but yeah. privately, yeah. folks go out and just yeah. spend a day in the woods and killing coyotes, which destabilizes yeah. the pack, which puts people's livestock at risk, all that kind of thing. To and it just your, yeah. yeah. To answer your I, I actually don't know where I stand yet because okay. the idea of of I mean the honest hunt. Right. is something noble and decent as part of our traditions. The idea to sort of recreational slaughter, to just kill them, is, is sort of disgusting. Yeah. However, I've also heard from farmers who are saying, oh, tell it to my chickens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, tell it to my, tell it to my cattle. Right. Right. The, 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 the coyotes are not yeah. their friends. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'm I not sure. Yeah, I don't know what she is. She okay. talks about All right. the still weighing in. Okay. Okay. Small okay. Okay. Over there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Our reporter yeah. left. Yeah. Our guest, Mason Wade. The other one. Sandy with House 531. You have to tell me. Oh, the. Childcare? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, adjust uh, market rates and benefits. Uh, a lot was this, basically we're talking about how we're going to increase taxes. How, are we talking about how to integrate education into being a part of this? Why aren't high school kids involved with uh, a, a, assistant programs to learn about childcare by aiding in this? How do we start? blending the younger people involved in the workforce again. It used to be the young people worked on the farms. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time that the young people started getting more involved with apprentice jobs that actually will maybe encourage them not to have kids <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and have a little better understanding about relationships and this and that. So we're, you know, when we're spending the money that this gentleman spoke about for education, what are we getting for a product? So, 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 the, so I believe that was a question. Um, the question was, so, no, about, are you about, considering about other ways besides tax dollars to make a difference in the result? There are, there are actually programs whereby young people in school work at child care centers. Yeah. Should we increase that? And because I, I, what I'm hearing is taxes are going to be increased when I hear discussion of adjusted market rates and benefits. That is code for get ready folks, taxes are rising. So, so, so the apprenticeship <laughs> programs actually have a cost. And I mentioned, I mentioned the, um, um, the scholarships and th that's a piece of it. And, but there are programs through the uh, area technical centers 
uh, and and through the community colleges. So all of those, but but that that so that is part of the bill. It's not free. Right. Well, we're already paying for education. It's it, it's uh, as a retired teacher. <laughs> Um, an early education teacher who spent a lot of time in preschool environments, um, not only at the school level, but also in community partner programs. Um, it's very complicated. You have a lot of dedicated young folks who, are, who, who would love to spend their entire careers in child care, in preschool, um, and it does not pay enough. It just doesn't. And $13 an hour, and that's not where most of these people start, is not enough to survive. And these people have their own families and their own bills to pay. And they do move on because they see an opportunity to um, better their lives by an increase in salary. And we have to invest in them. They want to be there. They want to stay. And we have to invest in them because they're good for our children. And we can't talk on the one hand about limiting abortions and then talk on the other hand about not supporting those kids who are then born. And also, I would just want to add, as far as the abortion thing, I'm also an adoptive parent. There are not enough homes in our country or in our state for the children who are waiting in the system for homes. So we can also talk sort of abstractly about limiting abortions, but we need to support the children who are then born, and we do not do that. Well, that's a problem. But here's an example. Going to your point, uh, you know, I brought this up before the, you know, okay, here's the deal. The supervisory union rents a building over on the dump road. They're spending almost $60,000 a year because the supervisor lives in New Hampshire and he can jump right off the highway. Meanwhile, in Rochester, we have an entire school that's empty. We have schools everywhere with space. Why could not the supervisory union be housed in buildings that are laying vacant? And we're, I just don't get, so that's six, let's call it $60,000. Just say, just say they magically jump to Rochester and the rent would be included in their, you know, whatever over there. But you were gifted $60,000 and said, okay, take this to Randolph or here in Bethel. Here's $60,000 for young mothers or children. How do you guys want to spend this money? That's just one supervisory union spending that kind of money. So if you add it up across the board with all this con school consolidation and empty buildings, if you just took the rent of the supervisory unions across the state, I guarantee you you're going to come up with almost $10 million a year. Yeah. Well, I can't That's a lot of money. Figures, but there's two things about the building being in Rochester. First of all, you're going to have to pay for the building to be open and heated and all that kind well, of the thing. Well, the building's going to Wait, 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 wait. But also, our, our school system, that is the center of that is not Rochester. So if you're sending all the administrators over to Rochester, we're going to spend three times as much sending them to the various schools where they have kids, which is also going to increase our bills. Well, that's so, an interesting point. So it's logistics. So it could be in Bethel. Which is but, valid. Logistics but, are valid. Yeah, no, I agree. But, but that, there isn't an empty building in, in Bethel. But, but OK, here, here's that's the other thing. If you add up the, the number of employees, I asked the supervisor huh? to send me the whole list of salaries. You should see the numbers. And there's 26 people over there doing all kinds of stuff. But meanwhile, we can't afford to pay our taxes. We're, the supervisory union across the, the state, sh I think, should be split by 50%. Just like we're consolidating the schools, the system, the upper system, should be consolidated. We don't need all the supervision. We need education. We don't need uh, supervisors coming into school and telling teachers how to teach, like they do in Rochester. We need. I mean, if you looked at the budget of the supervisor union across the state, your hair would flip. I've done it, and I've got so tired of looking at it because it just keeps going there. The tax money well, just keeps going to the top. Remember that I'm a teacher. I also have children who have special needs and who have a high price tag for right. taxpayers. But by paying that price tag, you are supporting my child becoming a functional member of society. That requires a certain amount of administration because he's really, really complex. But he's going to be functional. He's going to have a job. He's going to do all these things. It's a worthy investment. As far as the administration goes, can you consolidate it? Can you streamline it? Probably. I think we but could. But I, I also think that we need to be really thoughtful about that and how that 
how that impacts the kids who are then in the schools later. Some amount of supervision is necessary. Well, I think, I think yeah. if we really streamlined it and focused on, God bless you for being an angel on earth with your children. Well, That's no, sweet. I'm hard well, to be an angel on earth. Well, yeah. well, to do what you're doing, I, I believe you are. But what I'm saying is if, if the legislatures in the state could really, really, truly streamline the supervisory, just that section, and focus on children of need like yours, I'd, I'd pay more tax. I mean, there's just too much waste going into the, the, that level of, uh, of, of, of uh, quote unquote education at the supervisory level. The question I would have, and, I'll let, and then I know you guys need to go, so I'm not, but it would be interesting to have some figures around how much of that administration is um, administering federal guidelines on testing. There's a ton of that going on. There's a ton of energy being put into complying with these tests to the point where teachers are in, put in this really terrible position of almost having to teach to the test instead of how we'd like to have children be. Yeah, I've heard this. And I think that that, I, I think we could look into that because I think that there's a, there's a level of that that's happening that administrators would like to give up, that teachers would certainly prefer as I'm sure Dick can, can, you know, contribute to because he's been a teacher of this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. You'd rather teach to the facts and teaching how children how to think than how to take a test so that you're successful, so that your school doesn't lose funding. I mean, there's yeah. also trickle down in that, and so I think that's worth looking into oh, as well. And anyway, thank you guys all for coming, as always.